Rugged individualism, the pioneer spirit, self-reliance, those are all quintessentially American principles. But in his essay called Self-Reliance, Emerson takes that, that idea um, a step too far, I would argue, into the realm of, of narcissism and a solipsism. So he starts by um, talking about, um, you know, being a poet, being an artist, and being original. So the Romantics and then the Transcendentalists after them really made um, originality uh, the, the most important part of art. I mean, originality had always been an important uh, criterion for art, but the, the classical artist um, realized that, you know, it wasn't just about originality, that it, there were other principles and that they could actually learn some, you know, artistic truths from, from their predecessors. Um, again, the Romantics uh, didn't really go in for that. They, they, they wanted to kind of break away from uh, what came before. Again, like I said in my, my last lecture, the more I think about it, it's, it really is kind of what you could associate with adolescence. What teenager doesn't feel this intense urge to, to do the opposite of, of his or her parents, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, becoming his or her own uh, individual? It's like the, these romantic and transcendental artists just are perpetually stuck in adolescence. So Emerson at the beginning of Self-Reliance talks about uh, a painter who, you know, was original uh, by, um, you know, not, um, not conforming to anything that, that came before. So uh, Emerson, toward the bottom of the first page of the essay, says, trust thyself. Every heart vibrates that iron string. There, I think he's maybe alluding in part to, to Shakespeare, you know, the, the Shakespearean line, to thine own self uh, be true. Um, again, it's, a, it's a, an audacious claim, and I am all for uh, individualism. Um, but it, the, again, there's a, there's a line. Uh, I think ideally you're an individual but you, at the same time, you, you can be an individual and at the same time recognize your connection to what came before. Um, but <clears throat> Emerson says, society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. That That's one of the uh, prime examples of what I would call Emerson's solipsism. Nothing is sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Obviously, that again, that is, um, I mean, that's blas blasphemous, uh, you know, uh, judging by the, the biblical standard. Um, so, the, uh, the Irish poet, or I'm sorry, the the literary critic, uh, Harold Bloom, uh, he, he has this whole theory of poetic influence uh, in his canonical book called The Anxiety of Influence. If you read my essay, The Jack Doll Blooms in Purgatory, that's what that essay is dealing with. Uh, it's, it's applying Bloom's theory um, to one of W.B. Yeats plays and another play by... Um, Yeats benefactor, Lady Gregory, excuse me, but in his, um, uh, in his book, The Anxiety of Influence, Harold Bloom, um, he analyzes a bunch of different canonical, uh, poets and other writers, including Emerson. And so if you're following along in that essay, The Jack Doll Blooms in Purgatory, on page 18, uh, towards the bottom, um, Here's a quote from Bloom. He says, uh, one of the deniers of poetic influence, uh, Emerson, with his maxims, insist on yourself, never imitate. Rather than sharpen 
I'm sorry, here, here's my take on this. This isn't Bloom. Rather than sharpen their powers of discernment, however, uh, Emerson's blind self-reliance ironically increases his gullibility. Uh, and therefore, Emerson falls for a lot of the wackiness that would become transcendentalism. If you look into transcendental, transcendentalism, uh, you'll see that they believed in a, in a bunch of weird stuff. And, and so I'd argue one, one thing that made Emerson fall for that is, is this insistence on only the integrity of his own mind um, uh, being sacred. So, um, and so, you know, we saw in, in uh, nature this famous metaphor, uh, Emerson saying he's a, a transparent eyeball. Uh, I say um, that transparent eyeball is myopic. It's, it's turned inwards where, where he claims he's able to see everything objectively. Um, seems to me that's not the case. He only sees what he wants to see, mainly himself. And others see through him, but he does not even see others um, as they are. Bloom explains it this way, where the eye dominates... Uh, e y e the eye without curtailment by reality. In other words, where you see things, but you're not really, um, you know, trying to see reality. You're trying to see what you want to see. Um, the I, capital I, like the personal pronoun, reduces the self's awareness of other selves. Hence, Bloom says, the solipsism of our major poets, Emerson, Whitman, Dickinson, all three of those we're studying this week, Frost, Stevens, Crane, is augmented because the eye declines to be purged. Reality reduces to the Emersonian me and the not me. Now, and it, and it excludes all others except insofar as the precursors have become inescapable components of the me. Now, Bloom has a more positive spin on this because he was a sucker for, for Emerson. He says, this solipsistic absorption then according to Bloom, makes Emerson immune to the anxiety of influence. Bloom fails to mention, however, again, this is my take, that solipsism also results in self-indulgent art and, more importantly, familial and spiritual dysfunction. So there is, a, again, a darker side uh, to all of this. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the... Um, the next paragraph in Self-Reliance, the paragraph that begins, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Uh, and, and if we, we go toward the, the end of that paragraph, uh, Emerson says this, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within? My friend suggested, but these impulses may be from below, not from above. In other words, you're listening to these impulses. What if they're from the devil? And here's Emerson's reply. I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, but if I am the devil's child, I will live, I will live then from the devil. No law can be sacred to me, but that of my own nature, that of my nature. Good and bad are but names, very readily transferable to that or this. The only right is what is after my constitution, the only wrong, what is against it. Again, that's pure um, solipsism, pure moral relativism. Um, that there is no good and bad. It's all just relative. It's all what I say is good and bad. Very precarious um, position to, to hold. After all, you know, serial killers are right in their own eyes. So if there's no objective standard that exists outside of your eyeball, whether it's transparent or not, uh, that's not a, uh, a society in which I would want to live. Uh, so this, but this willingness to say, well, so be it, I'll, I'll follow the devil if, if that's, you know, where, where this leads, um, you know, that's not unique to, uh, to Emerson. In fact, if we go to, uh, page 24 in my essay, The Jack Doll Blooms in Purgatory, we see, um, and I, I quoted this one in the, the last lecture, um, where uh, we have Yeats identifying Emerson and Walt Whitman as writers who have begun to seem superficial precisely because they lack the vision of evil. Um, 
We might say the same of Bloom. For example, after quoting from Paradise Lost, Milton's famous poem, a passage whose last four lines reveal the absolute solipsism of Milton Satan. Here's what Satan says, Paradise Lost. A mind, a mind not to be changed by place or time. Sounds like what Emerson's talking about. Don't let time or place or circumstances change your mind. Your mind is what's sacred. The mind is, is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And what matters where if I be still the same? This is like a kind of infernal twist on the one of the famous lines in the film Shawshank Redemption where the character says, you know, I can be in prison, but as long as in my own mind I'm not in prison, then I'm still free. Well, I mean, there, there's something to that, but this, but to take that to the degree of completely denying reality is pathological in, in my view. Um, so here's what Bloom remarks about, see, Milton was, was trying to show how um, insane Satan was for, for thinking this way, but Bloom, like, like the, the romantic poets, actually kind of admired Satan. Not, it's not necessarily that they were theologically, you know, devil worshipers, but they, that they, I mean, and you can see how this works. We, we've already seen that the romanticism and transcendentalism, uh, you know, is all about making your own way, rebelling against the, you know, what came before. So, in their view, Lucifer was the was the ultimate rebel, you know, rebelling against God Himself. And so, Bloom remarks sarcastically, these lines that we just quoted from Paradise Lost to the C.S. Lewis or angelic school. So again, he's making fun of those, you know, of Christian believers like C.S. Lewis, represent moral idiocy in order to be met with laughter. If we have remembered to start the day with our good morning's hatred of Satan. If, however, we are not so morally sophisticated, and by that really blue means he thinks he is more morally sophisticated than, you know, um, primitive Christians um, we are likely to be very much moved by these lines of Satan. Bl uh, Bloom is moved by these lines because as a diehard romantic, he admires Satan's solipsism. And as a humanist, he considers himself too morally sophisticated to believe in the existence of evil. We already saw in nature uh, toward the end of it, um, Emerson essentially denies the objective reality of evil. Um, but I, I say, as, as Walker Percy reminds us, however, the Nazi intelligentsia thought the same. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to follow that thread. Um, but first, since the next kind of big quote in self-reliance, um, if we skip down, uh, we read this quote, uh, from Emerson, the doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love, when that pules and whines. Um, I shun father and mother and wife and brother when my genius calls me. I, so that sounds pretty radical. And you might be surprised to find that, that really uh, Emerson is quoting from the Bible here, except he's not quoting it faithfully. He's actually perverting it. Uh, again, he says, I shun father and mother and wife and brother when my genius calls me. Um, <clears throat> here he is um, alluding to Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 29, where Jesus says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or farms for my namesake shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says it even more harshly. He says something like, he who does not hate his father and mother and brother and sister and wife, etc., is not worthy to follow me. But what you have to understand is, if you look at it in the, the Greek and the Hebrew, Jesus is using hyperbole. He doesn't literally mean, uh, he doesn't mean you should literally hate your family members. I mean, that would go against so many other principles in the Bible. What he's saying is that, that 
if, if you are one of his disciples, you have to put him first, that even above your, your family, that that's the point. Um, and it really, he's, he's saying, don't break the first commandment. You shall have no gods, uh, before me. And so the idea is, you know, shun quote unquote, or, um, you know, even your own family members, if, if that gets in the way of you serving, um, God uh, appropriately, but instead of that, Emerson twists it, not, he doesn't shun father, mother, brother, etc., to follow God, but, but to do what? To follow when my genius calls me. Um, so it's a very different proposition. Emerson says, you know, I hate all these people if they get in the way of you following what you want to do, your genius. That's really the opposite of what the, the scripture he's alluding to um, is, is stating. <clears throat> All right. Um, here's another famous quote um, from Self-Reliance. Um, Emerson says, A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. So he's saying, you know, to be a true poetic genius, you can't be constrained by that pesky little thing called logic. You know, and it's okay to contradict yourself. Walt Whitman would, would restate that in Song of Myself when he says, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. Um, and right above this, uh, Emerson says, suppose you should contradict yourself, what then? It seems to be a rule of wisdom never to rely on your memory alone. Uh, scarcely even in acts of pure memory, um, but to bring the past for judgment into the thousand-eyed present. It, it, it reminds me of the you know, people who argue that the, the Constitution of the United States is a living, breathing document. Um, but that's a living, breathing document, but the Bible, according to many who have that view, is a dead um, document. But in both cases, they want to be able to interpret the Constitution and the Bible and anything else, not based on what it is or, or try to figure out the truth of what it says, but it's it's the game of making it say whatever you want it to say to, to fit whatever the current fads are. Um, Is the acorn better than the oak, which is its fullness and completion? Is the parent better than the child into whom he has cast his ripened being? Again, that's a, a, a quintessential uh, Emersonian uh, maxim in, in terms of, of one of the other videos. I, I mentioned John Piper's quote uh, or, or phrase, chronological um, snobbishness or chronological snobbery uh, that, you know, this, this willingness just to, uh, to imagine that whatever's new is what's true and everything that's old is, is, is inferior. Um, it, you know, it reminds me in the 1960s and the countercultural movement, which not accidentally was very much, um, inspired in part by like rom the romanticism um, that, that gave birth to transcendentalism. Um, uh, Jim Morrison, you know, The Doors was a huge fan of William Blake, uh, for instance. Um, but in the 60s, the, you know, the, the counterculture, um, the hippies and so forth, um, they had a saying, they said, don't trust anyone over the age of 30, right? Is this idea that and, and again, you see that these days, like on the far left, you know, let's, let's let the, um, well, actually I hadn't really thought about this in this context, but all the attention given to, uh, what's her name, Greta Sternberg, whatever the, this really, you know, this teenager in, um, in Sweden that we're, you know, supposed to give her a platform. In fact, the fact that not only does the fact that she doesn't have much experience or, or training or anything like that, not only does that not 
prevent her from being taken seriously by, again, those on the far left, but it, that's actually a badge of honor. You know, again, in this Rousseauian view, she hasn't been corrupted yet. Um, now, if we contrast this, then this idea of the, the acorn being more important or the oak being more important than the acorn that produced it, um, the child being better than the parent. Uh, I wanted to contrast this. I think this, this too is where another example of Emerson perverting uh, scripture. Um, so let's see, Matthew 10, verse 24. Yeah, uh, Jesus says exactly the opposite. Matthew, uh, so Emerson says, is the parent better than the child into whom he has cast his ripened being? So Emerson's saying the child is better, you know. Um, but here's what Jesus says in, in Matthew 10, 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. Um, now, again, there... Jesus is not uh, justifying slavery. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's an, an easily um, misread line, but it's a disciple is not above his teacher. And Emerson says the exact opposite here. Um, Emerson says, this should be plain enough. Yet see what strong intellects dare not, yet hear God himself, unless he speaks the phraseology of I know not what David or Jeremiah or Paul. We shall not always set so great a price on a few texts, on a few lives. So you see how Emerson is just basically saying the Bible is, is bunk. It's irrelevant. Why do we read about you know, Paul and David and Jeremiah? We need to essentially write our own Bible is kind of what he's uh, implying here. So um, th there's some other, some other quotes here that we could look at. Um, uh, let, let me just read this one uh, toward the end of the, the essay. Um, Emerson says, But compare the health of the two men, and you shall see that the white man has lost his aboriginal strength. Um, and, and so again, there's that romantic idealization of... The, the primitive, the aboriginal, excuse me. And but, but again, the irony, on one hand, Emerson says that, but on the other hand, when there are the primitive workers, we already, we saw in the last lecture how Emerson really has disdain for them, uh, that they're, they're getting in the way of his view of, of nature. Um, so, <clears throat> So in addition to confirming Bloom's contention that the ancestry of revisionism is heresy, so revising, you know, the Bible's heresy, by replacing God with my genius, Emerson commits the essential error of transcendentalism, which descended from European Romanticism and later developed into the humanism Bloom espouses. We talked about humanism in one of the last lectures. After all, rejecting the doctrine of original sin, secular humanists believe in the, quote, essential purity of humanity and thus obsess over bringing about utopia through social engineering. The implications are as horrific as those of genetic engineering. In fact, romanticism, humanism, and eugenicism are historically linked. It is no accident that Hitler's favorite composer was Wagner, the prototype of German romanticism, nor is it an accident that in 1957, the American Humanist Association named eugenicist and Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger Humanist of the Year. Anyway, I, I follow up on that and elaborate on that, but I want to skip ahead um, in my essay here. By themselves, human empathy and the desire to serve humanity, quote unquote, again in the abstract, bring no guarantee. Um, 
All right, we went over that one. Yeah. So now we're back to, to uh, we'll go back and finish that thread we started earlier. And this, this will, we'll wrap up this lecture here. Uh, Percy's novel, The Thanatos Syndrome, illustrates how humanism can lead to the wholesale slaughter of humans. In this novel, Percy explores the ramifications of the death instincts Lacan describes. Whereas, according to Bloom, neither Freud nor Emerson, quote, at the end was less than ambivalent toward the ego's mechanisms of defense against the repetitions driving us to Thanatos, it's a Latin word for death, Percy shows that we ensure our path to Thanatos, um, or is it, the, I guess, the Greek word uh, for death, if we rely only on our own defenses. The novel's eccentric, eccentric priest, Father Smith, serves as Percy's mouthpiece as he addresses protagonist Tom Moore. You are an able psychiatrist, on the whole a decent, generous, humanitarian person in the abstract sense of the word. You are a member of the first generation of doctors in the history of medicine to turn their backs on the oath of uh, Hippocrates and kill millions of old useless people, unborn children, born malformed children for the good of mankind. Later, Father Smith explains that the Nazi death camp, quote unquote, doctors emerged not from a class of uneducated, unfeeling louts, but from the most accomplished psychiatrist in 1930s Germany. Intellectuals known for their, quote, humane treatment of patients, idealists who, quote, had the Heidelberg smell about them, the romantic stink of the student prince. Father Smith concludes that when we think we are smart enough and compassionate enough of our own accord to do good without God, we become monsters, not the, these, you know, enlightened geniuses that, that Emerson thought we would become. In this way, tenderness leads to the gas chambers. Thus, while he is right to despise Yeats' eugenics, Bloom might be well served to take a closer look at his own romantic slash humanist philosophy.